What up Gripsters and YouTubers, Evan Jarvis here for Gripst Poker Training and today I have a very special final table review of my biggest online win ever with the one and only Ben CB. In this video, you are gonna learn how to accurately value your chip stack at a final table and that's whether you are a mega stack or a micro stack. The results will surprise you a little bit. You are also gonna learn a magic pill to take the pressure off of final tables, courtesy of Ben CB himself, and how to deal with the inevitable disappointment and depression that always come with finishing anywhere other than first place. You will also learn the importance of adjusting your betting lines and preflop ranges on final tables when ICM is in play, and why trying to play balanced is almost certainly costing you money. If you like this type of video, hit that like button to let me know. Now let's get into the action, and let's get stacking. Uh, we're going to start with the first hand here on this huge final table, 180,000 for first and kind of opens it up with his almost 30 big blinds, min raise and we're in the big blind. Um, pretty much no brainer decision here. Um, and we call and we flop two pair, which is of course very, very sweet. Um, to, to start things off, which is always really important when thinking about the flop. How would you think, how would you perceive him open raising here uh, with his deck size from the cutoff, also seeing all the other stack sizes? I think with that stack size there, he's going to be opening a lot of his Broadway hands, uh, suited aces, suited kings, probably not all the suited kings, but some of the suited kings, uh, some strong suited connectors. And I think with his particular stack size, I don't know if I'd expect him to raise all the pairs with the shorter stacks in play i could see him kind of like lopping off the bottom of his range and sticking to more high card heavy hands um but i think he's gonna have a lot of the like broadways and strong yeah. suited connectors yeah. what about you yeah i think broadways and not necessarily suited connectors because um it's of, of course it always depends on how icm aware is but for those who are watching if you're in that situation an eight seven suited is not a good open with this deck size because a lot of dv comes from uh, our opponents reshoving have an ace or a king so like a king seven suited is a much better open race than let's say a nine seven suited even though it might have more playability and looks prettier um even an ace eight off is much better um and still relatively tight i, I think not more than 25 percent should be somewhat of a threshold here because otherwise we end up race folding way too much i mean um we ca we don't really want to race call ace queen here but we also don't want to be open shoving so I think most people would race call ace queen, um, but it's it's very very close um, since there are two shorter stacks present. And if you can't really race call ace queen, then you know you shouldn't be open raising a lot of hands because if you open raise let's say thirty percent and you're only going to be race calling five percent of the time, you will just end up losing so many big blinds every single time. And um, that's why you want to you can incorporate some limbs. This would. Uh, help you out to play a few more hands. So if you have a 10-9 suited, jack-9 suited, a queen-jack off, limping in those hands, of course, mixing in some traps, this helps you to keep your VPIP a little higher than if you would play a race first in strategy only. But this is very player dependent. If you have rather passive players, even though they have big, bigger stacks, then just keep raising your 25-30% uh, and you will get away with it. However, this is the, the, the approach we want to go with and then make adjustments depending on how players play. Sometimes in certain ICM setups, I would even go down to like 18%, 17% because I know they're going to be reshoving any pair, any suited ace. Then the big blind can 3-bit a lot of sh hands against me. And we have a stack size where we can't really 4-bit forward anymore. So um, we, we have to make a decision uh, either to risk our entire stack or to fold. So it's a very awkward stack size for us to play against three bets. Yeah. But yeah, King 10 off here. If in your, sh in your shoes here, bluff three bidding, you want to be three bidding hands like, like a king, for example, like uh, king six off or ace three off. You really want to be blocking those ace kings. Um, calling is not going to happen with this stack size anymore. Um, so yeah, blocking the ace king aces or kings or queens combos is really viable or ace queen combos. So something that can still make a top pair, even something like queen four suited, an off suited ace, or um, yeah, like an off suited king or suited king. Like these are the kind of hands where you don't want to be three winning six five suited because you block a lot of his folds, like pocket sixes, pocket fives, ace six, ace five, 
or you don't want to be bluffing eight seven suited because an eight or a seven is very much part of his race forward range like an ace eight off a seven off or ace eight suited or king eight king seven suited uh, also you don't want to be bluffing with a nine or ten like jack ten or ten nine what i often see um this is really the the, the head the range we are taking so here blocker effects are very important and since the stack to pot ratio is is going to be close to one post flop anyway um <clears throat> like if we three bet yeah maybe yeah. yeah maybe two to one right and then it's not that if you have a if you have a pseudo connector you you can't really leverage your back to equity or playability on later streets because very often you're going to get it in on the flop or turn so um you you're not having this playability of yeah i can borrow this hand i have a lot of back to equity then you, you bet the turn and then you shove the river this is not going to happen with this deck size so you're yeah, making a top pair and then playing a small pot um trying to play a small pot still with your top pair of course is the goal but it's very important to just make top pairs block his top pairs um playing against the ace highs and uh not trying to be too fancy with suited connectors yeah so so is like queen jack off kind of the worst hand yeah um in terms of like offsuit high card hands we yeah. want a three bet bluff with because yeah. it still makes jack. top pair at a reasonable rate yeah like no queen jack off just good enough as a call because we still yeah. we still dominate um we still dominate um queen tans jack tans that we're falling out so in single race pots we we want to call hands that still dominate hands in this range if uh, with a king five off we fold out much better king highs but with queen jack you don't fold out so many better hands right um, so there's no point in three betting but with an offsuit of king you fold out so many better hands and they're only going to be king queen king jack that he's calling and then he's going to call ace highs some jack tens maybe queen jack suited so our outs are a little bit more cleaner of course there's still going to be scenarios where we have reversed implied outs when we hit our king that's going to happen like um right but in general the blocker effects are very important here yeah yep cool uh, but also of course keep your frequencies in, in in mind because you probably just want to reshuffle ace queen pre pocket tens you might just three bet ace king aces kings queen so if you already have a king five off you have 16 combinate or 12 combinations uh if you take an ace twos off you have another 12 combinations so you're already gonna be it's easy to overbluff these spots and some regulars are doing it and that's why maybe some people see me on streaming then just forbid shoving ace four seated because i know it's just even with ic i'm super profitable because 80 percent of the time they're gonna be three bit falling yeah once once you get into making plays with the offsuit combos instead of the suited combos the frequency goes way up yeah <clears throat> so what's your plan here on the flop my plan on the flop, uh, well, once we get a bet from him, is to build the pot against either the combo draws or the worst kings and set it up to basically have one to one and a half uh, stacked pot ratio on turn. Yeah. Um, I don't really want to give him a free pull with his gut shots by taking a check call line, so I just want to charge the strong hands that he has. Yeah. And if he has a weaker hand, I'm, I'm okay with taking the pot down here. Um, I really like your approach. I think um, what most people do wrong is trying to balance their range with their ultra strong hands. But the problem is, and this is something, this is not necessarily just according to GTO, but also a very exploitative play that if this guy has king eight suited or king nine, like he's supposed to fold a lot of top hairs. But most people won't. They, they put you on a draw, even in an ICM situation. You have to be very careful here. Um, and also actually checking back, like, just running into a better hand is so detrimental for your EV. And he's not supposed to be C betting as much as he would in a cheap EV situation. So the, I would always play straightforward here. I would always play straightforward, only take some really uh, high equity blood. I, I, even even king loose and like against very good opponents, raising your king loose and spades is really good. Because if he has king nine and clubs, king jack and clubs, if you raise the flop, jam the turn, he's supposed to fold those, especially when he blocks our queen jack, jack nines. Uh, maybe if he has king jack with the jig, jack and hearts himself, uh, jack and spades himself, we're gonna fold out better spades. Um, he might get it in with ace high flush draws. He has queen jack, jack nine. He thinks we're goofing around and then he jams and we have his draws crushed. If he has an ace king, we're in good shape. We cover him. So in these kind of situations, let's say if I play against someone i know he's icm aware i then he's going to fold some better king x um plus what most people 
do wrong here is they fast play too many weaker draws. Uh, we have those crushed. So yeah. I would I would fast play those hands and of course our two pairs and uh, value hands or pocket sixes that we might have your 10-6. And with your like strong draws like ace jack of spades, ace queen of yeah. spades, are you looking to fast play too yeah, because yeah. you may get it in with the weaker draws? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have ace queen and spades. I would just jam pre ace jack and spades is is a reasonable call. Like it just makes so much money post flop, um, by by just calling. The reshuffle DV for reshuffling is so little. Like it's certainly plus EV, but you make more money by just calling. Um, and there's no need to um to play higher variance here where you cover everyone to your left which is very very important you can just you have so many profitable race first in spots so this is from the mindset here for final tables very important when it comes to these situations you just sit down and you think about the like i always picture it like a battlefield you know it's like okay my opponents here to the left and the right and what's my strategy here and always try to consider that in my decision making system and try to not put myself in a situation that is going to be detrimental for my for my wars against other opponents on the table. Yeah. Because if I lose five million here, the guy to my left covers me. I will immediately lose EV in the future because I will have less race first in spots. I take that for margin of spots. So if I ace jack, I'm not really sure is it better to reshuffle or to call. I know, okay, I'm in such a good position, maybe I shouldn't take that risk here. However, if, if it's vice versa and through a risky play, I might put myself in a much better situation because like, I'm going to cover the players to my left and right. I might take a more marginal spot because I, it put me in a better situation, but you are already in a great situation. Covering the, the guy two to your right doesn't really matter. It's, it's not going to help you a lot because um, you still have position on him. You're still quite deep. You can still flood a lot of hands. And you're not going to be three winning a lot against him anyway. You don't want to play a big pot. Yeah. So also, yes, one might say, well, but then we cover him and he can't open raise so many hands. But the thing is, you always have position on him anyway. You want to play button versus hijack, cut and cut versus hijack, and he's going to open raise a very loose range and you still can call a lot of hands. You always have position on him. Yeah. And also his your big blind versus his button, so you get a good price, you can peel a lot of hands anyway, see a flop against this extremely wide range, and then take it from there. So and, it's, and it's like, a, yeah. Even if we don't cover him, if we have like 80% of his chip stack, we can dent him so much that he's st like, we basically have almost the same amount of leverage as if we had him covered when we're like one <clears> and two, right? Yeah, exactly. You always have to see the chips as your soldiers and, and really want to make sure you put them in the right battles and um, hopefully come with more soldiers back. <laughs> yeah, do you remember who first popularized that way of looking at the chips? No. Doyle Brunson, Super System. Really? Original book. Yeah, no, I never read his book. Soldiers. He said the soldiers were his troops, and the reason he would you know, back up his draws was he didn't want to leave his men out there unprotected. Oh, wow. So You know where I have it from? I have it from the book, uh, The Millionaire Fast Lane, but he uh, emphasizes on that topic by using money so it's like every dollar yep. he sees as a soldier and as investment and that's like hey it's the same for poker yeah and uh so that that really helped me for the mindset if you think about what's the right mindset for a final table to to make sure i want to i want to gain as many soldiers as possible or if i send them in the war that the chance of winning the war are very high yeah, protecting your favorable position. Yeah. And like relative to the other players. Yeah, I love that way of looking at it. It's great. So much talking about having top two pair, but uh, I, I see a lot of players fucking up the spot, playing their value hands really bad. And and, and what they do wrong is I always focus on when when they have shit hands, how trying to play their shit hands good, their draws, their weak holdings, bluff catchers. But in order to make money in poker, that's where the highest CV spots, you have to play your value hands properly. And so many might think, wow, but, but this is no brainer. Believe me, there's so many that do this wrong here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I think right. we may see in one of the later hands where I may have made a mistake because I'm trying to be balanced as opposed to just playing this situation yeah. here. You know, this unique spot. Uh, I would make it a little smaller. Yeah. Uh, 1.3 million, I think, is totally enough. Oh. Perfect turn card. Yeah. Obviously. And uh, my game plan on this turn is basically, if we can just pause it real quick. Yep. 
um, to go with a super small sizing because if he's turned to flush, all the money's going to get in anyway yeah. with a less than one SPR. And if he has just a king, I want to give him a price that he feels like he just can't fold for. I found that the players on America's card room are a bit stickier than they are on other sites and people like to call down. And I just want to give him that price that he just cannot yeah. fold for and will get an amazing price on the river as well for the shove. Yeah. It also allows you to to pick a very, very cheap sizing for your for your bluffs. Um, <clears throat> it would be, let's say, if the turn would be nine in diamonds, you just want to shove. So whenever yep, the board is, remains very dynamic, you just want to shove. Also your draws. You're going to pick up even maybe an additional gut shot uh, to your or an additional pair, let's say. If the, even if the turn is a queen and you have something like queen nine, um, you can just shove. Um, or it's, it's a nine in diamonds and you have queen nine in spades. Uh, make him trying to fold queens, jacks, ace ten, um, and you also want to do it with your with your value hands because even if he let's say he has queen ten or pocket queens, he still has five outs, right? So you really want to protect your equity, make it as exp if you bet one third or one quarter on a turn like this, he has an easy call because he gets the right outs with his uh, right price with his uh, five outs plus uh, implied outs, right? Mm -hmm. Or if he has a one cut flush draw with ace high or whatever, um, so you don't really make allow him to make mistakes. So whenever the board remains quite dynamic, you just want to shove. You just want to protect your hand. Um, yep. Even though you might run into better hands, he might have a set or a straight, of course. Um, and uh, on this board where the equities are locked up, just bets more. Yeah. Yeah, we're not playing this hand to try to find a hero fold if uh, it ends up being a cooler. Talk yeah. to against a set or against a straight. Oh, you shove the river? Yeah, this so yeah. this is the thing here with his king two in diamonds. That's what I meant. He should never see yeah. it in the first place. This is a huge mis like, not a huge mistake, but it ends up being in a, a, a costing him a lot of chips later on. You just want to pot control here, even though the board is strawy. You want to keep the pot small and check back a lot of hands like mid pairs, weak top pairs. Whenever you don't have three streets of value in ICM, just check it back. Protect your range, especially against the bigger stack. As a bigger stack, you're always incentivized, you know, to bluff a little more, be a little bit more aggressive against checks. So then let it hang yourself. Like you have an easy call on the turn and easy call on the river, but you still have then, the pot is not going to be so big. You still have three yeah. million behind. You're still in the tournament. Yeah. Uh, this might sound very results oriented, but I see this mistake over and over again. I'm not surprised. That's why I haven't seen this hand before. I yeah that's I'm, I'm really not surprised to see that here i i also feel like in these spots especially on final tables when the spr is really low it's important to do a lot of pot controlling and protect your stack whereas yeah. when when the pot's significant to you it's important to protect your equity and kind of end the pot as quickly as possible yeah um rather than take variance on it and i find that some people don't make that adjustment as they get deeper in the tournament and realizing when the size of the pot represents a large percentage of the total chips in play yeah it's a very different strategy than at the beginning where it represents a very small amount yeah of all those chips i mean what can you really have like he's just calling for a split right yeah the thing is you're not check raising king nine you're not check raising king eight so you have king 10 here like yeah. so often and you're not shoving tens. You, you tens are not good anymore here where he has so many kings. Uh, you shove tens pre very likely. So that's what I mean where people are to overvalue their absolute hand strength. Oh, a top pair, but it's it's an ICM situation. You've got to be, you, you're supposed to be so nitty. And it has nothing to do with being exploited. And also this open race in the first place is not good. I'm just, yeah. And we don't need to talk about his river decision or his, his turn decision or flop decision that's where it already starts on pre-flop just for pre-flop and then right. don't see it on the flop and then everything that happened on the turn or river would never happen and i also would never then study this spot because i don't want to end up being in this game tree at all so i know okay the mistake had, had on the flop i don't need to analyze whether i have to bluff catch the river or not because in, in future i won't never be in this spot anymore because i learned from this mistake the mistake happened on the flop and then you don't need to waste your time whether you have to bluff catch here also maybe an advice for studying efficiently Did he snap call? I'm pretty sure he snap called. I mean, Ben, he's got a full house. He's got kings full of sixes. 
Wow. I, it's definitely worth thinking about. Like, yeah. I mean, the thing so is, though, that he's still he's calling three million for a pot of so basically he's calling a pot size bet because he's only ca only calling for the three million. Yeah. Right. So he still needs to be good good thirty three percent of the time. You need to be shoving king eight, king seven, but you're never raising it. You don't come to the roof king eight, king seven. You don't you don't jam flush draws. So you have to be on a monkey bluff, which is very, very, or it's just king 10. It's pocket sixes. Yeah. It's like you have those hands and that's going to be the majority of the time. But that's where you don't need to be balanced with your bluffs because you're going to be paid out here. Like if I would, if I would put this in the software and then, and give you a reasonable range, he has to fold those hands. He has to fold king deuce here, which sounds ridiculous, but. You would you would check you would, you would check a flush right you would never jam like it makes yeah. no sense to jam a flush there. There's no reason to jam a flush. Um, so let's pause it here. Yep. Um, just so we can run the ICM at this point because this is the spot where, well, suddenly I'm, I started the day just expecting to cash for maybe a thousand dollars in this tournament. You know, some days you run really well, and um, now I found myself in a spot where it was the first time the entire day that I actually thought about the money, which was a mistake because it took me out of just playing the game and just playing the chips to now having the financial implications kind of hit my nervous system and get that excitement in there. Yeah. You know, when you're like, oh shit, how would life be different if I won like 180 instead of just 20? And that started to affect my play a bit because I started to connect myself with, oh, I could get first. And now I'm playing for that as opposed to just playing every spot uniquely. And I definitely got a little bit nervous when that when this happened. Because now I felt like it was going to be a failure if I didn't win the tournament. And I had extra pressure on myself, which should not be there, right? Absolutely. I'm, I can show you. Um, we want to talk about the ICM values? Yeah, just to see at this point in the tournament with seven people left, what everyone's expected value or ICM value is. I can give you a very, 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 very good advice here. And uh, some sort of a magic pill for final tables. Uh... Ben has a magic pill. I went through 30 hours of master class training and he told <laughs> me there was no magic pill and I'm finally going to get it. <laughs> there, there for sure. My magic pill is I never look at the payout structure. Yeah. That, that works for me. Because yeah. at the end of the day, the payouts are always relatively the same. At, at least for the poker side. Party poker has a little bit of different payout structure than the poker stars. American Card Rooms has a little bit pay, different payout structure. But when you play one side, they're mostly the same. Uh, and, and, and this just helps me. I never know what's for first. I never know what's for second place. Like I know when the bubble is, I know the, the pay jumps, there's like between 15 and 12, then 12 to nine, and then nine, eight, seven, six other pay jumps. That's important to know. I know when the next pay jump is, of course, but I don't know for how much money. Yeah. Uh, and tru and truthfully, normally I, I wouldn't have been looking, but the, the viewers wanted me to have the payouts on stream, so I had to put them there. Yeah, that's, that's the disadvantage of streaming, right? <laughs> Oh, that I thought it was the fact that your opponents can see your cards and hear all your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so NTs are sixty-seven thousand, roughly. Doesn't really matter. So Okay, let's look at the ICM values. So your ICM value is 22%, which means you hold 22% of the current price pool. Your share of the price pool, your ICM value is 22%. So the magic pill here is, if you work more often with these numbers, okay, this, there's something wrong with the last deck. Yeah, there's one zero missing here. Um, this is here. Oh, wait, no, also, yes, yeah, it's wrong. Yeah, there's one zero missing for you. Oh, you thought I was green block, green boss for a minute. Oh, here's six. Yeah, okay, he's correct. Yeah, this should now be fine. Yeah, so we're, we're the 20.5%. Yeah. And he's the 18th. Yeah. So the pressure comes from thinking, oh, wow, like I have almost uh, one third more chips than this guy. Yeah. I have almost twice more than the chips than everyone else, like even sometimes three times, almost four times than the other players. 
Um, this, this creates a lot of pressure. But once you know, once you understand the ICM values, it's, it's not that much more. You only have 2% more than cutoff. Mm -hmm. And you only have actually twice more than MP and UTG mm -hmm. in terms of ICM value. So nothing is carved in stone. Your advantage is 2%. There's still so much going on. So yes, you have a lot of chips, but in terms of ICM value, you're not really the chip leader. Yeah, yes, you're the chip leader, but not by, by a large margin. And this is yeah. what matters. So yeah. there are two, three all-ins that you're not involved. Other players double up. You're third in chips again. Yep. That's why. Also, it helps you for the short stacks. Yes, you think, oh, I have one quarter of the stack of the chip leader. Dude, you have only half of the ICM value of his stack. You have only half of his share. Right? It's not that little. Even if we, even let's say, if we give him 100K, five big blinds. You still have 4% of the price pool. It's like five big blinds sounds so little, but you still have 4% in EV here, which is very, very valuable. If we break it down of the entire price pool, that's tens of thousands of dollars. And that's where some of you are, five big plans, whatever, YOLO, I don't care if it's plus EV. But if you start thinking more about ICM values and dollar EVs, you will be way more patient on final tables. Mm -hmm. You will be way more relaxed as a chip leader. Yes, you will play a your aggressive game. Uh, you will try to pick up as many pots as possible, but you're not forcing yourself trying to win the tournament. Yep. Right? Yep. Oh man, it's gonna like, make the, I, I, the later. Believe me, if, if we would if you would be seeing the, the ICM values next to the chips, you would play completely different. Yeah, because even even with that twenty percent, my ICM value is probably around a hundred thousand. Right? I'm in line with kind of third place money, so it's not the same level of pressure as what a lot of people do are oh, I'm in first, I'm pairing myself with one eighty. Yeah. And they're having that expectation, which is just so unrealistic. <laughs> exactly. It's um, probably not even one hundred thousand. It's like, yeah. yeah, on average now with your stack, you're probably going to win around, I don't know, 80,000, 90,000, even as 100,000, yeah. but you never attach to these 180,000. It already takes $80,000 pressure off. Mm -hmm. Because Which also is. then the frustration afterwards, if you get fifth, you're like 60,000, but I expected one, uh, one, 180,000. So you have this gap of 120,000. This is so painful for the next weeks. But when your expectation is only 80, 90,000, it's like, okay, I, I made 20, 30,000 less than on average I was expecting. One bad beat and boom, that can happen. Mm -hmm. You take it much easier. Yeah. Every final table. All right. And that wraps up this part of our final table review of my biggest online win ever. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found the video insightful and informative and found some really good lessons that you can take to the tables and take to the bank when you're done putting in your work on there. To get the most out of your viewing experience, comment below with your key takeaways or aha moments. It's been proven in education that by being involved with the learning process and active, you will double your retention by writing down your thoughts. Um, to get even more out of your viewing experience, if you read others' comments and respond to them, you will bring up that level of retention even more and probably bring it up to a 75 or 90% level which is pretty sweet because there was a lot of information shared in this review that's gonna help you with your poker game, winning more money on tournament final tables. If you wanna learn more from Ben, check out my reviews of the Tournament Masterclass and his Poker Mindset course, Unchained, A Powerful Mind. And to learn more from me, check out my free MTT training course at grips.com forward slash free. The next part of this series will be uploaded next Monday and I look forward to seeing you there. And until next time, you know what to do. Take what you learned, Go out there and get stacking.